Indeed, Mr. Stafford likewise has recognized this distinction, for in his debate against Robert Bowman, he made reference to the uses of proskuneo found in the Old Testament given to the kings of Israel, but then said, quote, not, of course, the same worship that God himself is given in the religious sense, end quote. Now, the simple fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ is not only worthy of such worship, but he is clearly seen to receive it in the Bible. As time is short, I will give only one example, but it is, I truly believe, beyond refutation. In Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, we see a vision of the highest form of worship as it exists in heaven. God is seated upon the throne, and the pure, holy inhabitants of heaven are involved in constant worship before that throne. Mirroring, in many ways, the vision of Isaiah, we read, quote, and when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Not only does John here use proskuneo in its highest and fullest form, but we read of the ascription of worthiness, glory, honor, and power, all terms commonly associated with true religious worship, which is to be given to God alone. If this is not the kind of worship that is never, ever to be given to any created thing, then we have no possible way of defining true worship from the biblical texts. And yet, keeping this in mind, let us look quickly at Revelation chapter 5. Beginning in verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as a slain. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the continuation of the scene we saw in chapter 4. The context is still heavenly worship. But now we see another object of this worship, the lamb who was slain. The same complex of words including worthiness, power, honor, glory, and blessing appear with their direct object being the worship and adoration of the Lamb. He who sits on the throne and the Lamb are the objects of the worship of every created thing, including the highly exalted heavenly beings. I submit that not only here do we have worship that is utterly and completely inappropriate for any creature, no matter how exalted, but that if in fact Jesus Christ, the slain lamb, is indeed only an exalted creature, then it would have been his absolute duty to reject the worship of the created universe here given to him and instead to take his place as a creature in the adoration of God upon the throne. But such is not what we see, for the lamb is indeed worthy of the worship of every creature. Hence, he is God, not a God. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what's going on in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 right now. I've been holding off on that and waiting on it. There's something I hope you noticed when we read that whole account during Dr. White's opening statement, but if you didn't, I'll be sure to point it out right now. Going back to Revelation chapter 4. He referred to verses 9 through 11, and whenever the living creatures offer glory and honor and thanksgiving to the one seated on the throne, the one that lives forever and ever, the 24 creatures fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, Jehovah, even our God, etc. The world translation as Jehovah, Greek text says, Lord. Then he used that as a basis for reading Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 through 14. 
I never once saw the word proskuneo used towards anybody directly in that entire account. Maybe I missed it. Let's take a look. And I saw standing in the midst of the throne the four living creatures in the midst of the elders as though it had been slaughtered a lamb, having seven horns and seven eyes, which mean the seven spirits of God that have been set before the whole earth. And he went at once and took it out of the, the hand of the one seated on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. That's not the word proskuneo. Having each one a harp and golden bowls that were full of incense, and incense mean the prayers of the holy ones. And they sing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered, and with your blood you bought persons for God of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. And they are to rule as kings forever and ever. The text goes on. I saw and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, The Lamb was slaughtered and is worthy to receive the power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. No mention of proskuneo. And every creature that is in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth and on the sea and all the ones in them I heard saying, To the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might forever and ever. No mention of proskuneo. And the four living creatures went saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. There's proskuneo. Not once in that entire account did you have a proskuneo reference of directly applied to anyone but the one seated on the throne. At the very end, you have a general reference to worship. And that's supposed to be the convincing argument that's going to lead us to believe that no creature is so exalted and worthy of the kind of worship that the one seated on the throne receives. He never receives it. Not in this context. That was all implied. You read that as much as you want. You will never find a reference in there to the, the lamb being given the same kind of worship being given to the one seated on the throne back in Revelation 4, 9 through 11. So let's not operate under a misunderstanding here. The lamb is worthy to receive blessing, riches, glory, and honor because he was slaughtered and bought persons for God of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people on earth. God is worthy to receive worship because he created all things and because of his will they existed and were created. So we'll talk about the relationship between those two in creation a little bit later on. But there's nothing anywhere in here that suggests that the lamb was ever given directly proskuneo, not once. And again, when we're talking about angels or created beings, where's this notion of a creature in the Bible discussed that suggests that they just can't be exalted high enough to really matter? I don't find that anywhere. You mean to tell me that an exact copy of Jehovah God himself isn't worthy of glory and honor and blessing? I find that incredible to suggest that anyone could think of a copy of Jehovah God as anything other than something so magnificent and powerful that, is, that to suggest that they're not worthy of almost everything that Jehovah God himself is worthy of. And that is exactly what Jehovah God suggests by the way he allows those others to treat his son. In Hebrews 1.6, it doesn't just say the angels worship the son. It says God says, let all the angels worship him, proskuneo. This is something God allows for his son. Now, I don't know how many of you have children in the audience. We're not just talking about some angel, some created being. We're talking about God's special son, his firstborn. Now, some may say, well, you know, it's not really, he's not really a firstborn, literally. It's just preeminence. Really? Then who's God's real firstborn? Shouldn't that be someone of importance, don't you think? Given the importance attached to firstborn in the Bible? Don't you think that God, his very, someone had to be his first creation? Who is it if it's not Jesus Christ himself? And if it's not, why aren't we talking about that one? Where's the special place given to him? It is Jesus Christ, and that's why he's talked about the way he is. He's God's firstborn son. 
And there's no reason at all why he shouldn't be given all of the praise and honor and relative worship that his position as king of God's kingdom deserves. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing idolatrous about it because the only idol that Christ represents is the very image of God himself. Colossians 1 says so. The image of the invisible God. And if that's an idol, then I'll worship it because that's what the Bible tells me to do. I'm not coming to the Bible trying to figure out how I can fit my religion with it and my concepts. If the Bible tells me to do something, then I'm going to do it. If the Bible tells me he's God's firstborn and he's God's image and that he so perfectly reflects God's will and attributes so that I should look to him and give him my respect and worship, then that's what I'm going to do. Why? Because for this very reason Paul said, to the glory of God the Father. It would be idolatry if it was to the glory of Christ himself. But it's not. And that's the key. It's not idolatry. Because everything we do to worship or show honor and respect towards Christ is a reflection on how we would worship and treat his Father. He said so, so many times. He was not here to gain his own will. He was not here to teach his own teachings. Everything he did and taught and showed was from the Father. Everything we do towards the Christ goes through him to the Father. So we do not have these problems, this problem of idolatry in terms of setting up a second God and, and worshiping him in place of God. Christ is the manifest image of God in everything he does and, and his even appearance according to the scriptures. So these aren't problems that we actually have to face. They're imaginary. They're conjured up. Not that they're done so by an ill motivation, but they're, mis they're misleading ideas because, again, this is a difficult concept. It's easy to think of God in terms of having exclusive devotion and only having one being and not being uh, complicated with other secondary individuals. But this idea of secondary and creature, and you get caught up in the, the rhetoric that suggests that there's some impropriety involved in, in giving a creature this kind of worship. Again, this is a perfect being, sinless, exact representation of God, but a representation nonetheless. If the Bible says that's okay, then it's okay. So again, we still are left with the problem of trying to explain how Christ is the same God as the Father when the Bible never says so. But yet the Bible does tell us that Christ is an individual deity. He was with God and was a God. As far as what a God means in that text, it's very simple. It either means he was God name of the Trinity, because there's only one God, right? If you believe in the Trinity, there's one God. That's the Trinity. If Christ was God, he was the Trinity. Or you don't mean God when you say God. And that's what I meant by that earlier. I mean God when I say God, or a God. By God, I mean the Father, one God the Father, just like Paul said. When I say a God, I mean a God, an individual deity. So. In the, te in the case of John 1, 1, you have a very clear instance of Jesus being with God and being a God. You can't get around the fact that he's either identified as God, capital G-O-D, and he'd have to be the Trinity or the Father in that case, or he's a God. There's no other way to get around an indefinite or definite semantic, and that's something I'll bring up in my cross-examination a little bit later on. He's saying the fullness of deity dwells in him in bodily form. Now, who is deity to a monotheistic Jew? I think we all know the answer to that question. And so when we consider this issue, I want to bring us back to what I said initially. Are we monotheists who believe that only one God exists who is worthy of our worship, being acknowledged as our creator, and being identified as Yahweh, or are we henotheists? And as henotheists, what message do we have to the world? Whose name do we proclaim? What are we doing when we encounter <clears throat> other religious movements and their gods? How do we present biblical truth against all the religions of men when we have to admit, when we have to say, well, our foundational documents, 
that which we believe comes from God directly actually doesn't give us a clear means of recognizing who he is. I submit to you that in my opening statement, I have laid out an argument and we need to have it, it, it needs to be rebutted fully for there to be any chance of the thesis of Jesus being a God to succeed this evening. And that is we need to have an answer given to us. <clears throat> How can we avoid the sin of idolatry. If it is wrong to give the highest form of worship to Jesus Christ, what in the world is going on in Revelation chapter 5? And if you can look at Revelation chapter 4, and then you can look at Revelation chapter 5, and say, well, it's very obvious that in Revelation chapter 4, we have true religious worship going on, but in Revelation chapter 5, we don't. Upon what basis? Upon what basis? Exegetically, where do we derive this from the text? Now, Mr. Stafford began by saying what he wants you to do is to consider that it, it might be possible that Jesus is a separate ontological God from the Father, a second God. I do not, I cannot begin to understand how that is not in essence saying it might be possible that henotheism is true. And some might say, well, that has pejorative connotations. I don't know what other term to use. It accurately represents the idea of one major God, but then the existence of minor gods who are acknowledged and in some sense worshipped, done obeisance to, communicated with, play some part in the scheme. I don't know how else to describe the, the, the term. I'm not using the term to try to raise emotions. I'm using it to describe the position as accurately as I possibly can. That's what this debate is about this evening. For obviously, if someone says Jesus is a God, they must believe in some way, shape, or form in henotheism, functionally. And I say to you, the scriptures do not teach that. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, not all men have this knowledge. What he's saying is, we know that while there are many gods and many lords out there, for us, one God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, we exist for him. We exist through him. Yes, they've taken different roles in regards to creation. Yes, they've taken different roles in regards to redemption. And I'm awfully glad that they did. For it was the son's great love that caused him to voluntarily make himself of no reputation and to take on human flesh. Thank you very much.